I'd like to take a moment to let you all know about a new nonprofit organization started by my brother Craig. It's called Treats and Truth. They fill oversized brown lunch bags with snack items, chips, crackers, popcorn, cookies, etc. Also, a bottle of water, toothbrush, toothpaste, sanitary wipes, and most importantly, a small gospel tract book of John. No cigar? I'll have to talk to him about that. The bags are then hand-delivered to the homeless and people in need in and around the Los Angeles area. Let's help get this ministry off the ground. They're a 501c3 tax-exempt organization, so any and all donations are tax-deductible and greatly appreciated. Visit their website at treatsandtruth.org. Check out the show notes for the link. Also, please follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Welcome to episode 74 of the Burning Bush Podcast, where we share the message of the Bible while enjoying a good cigar. Hope everybody's doing well this week. Glad you could uh, listen to the podcast. And this week we continue reading through Dr. Justin Bass's book, The Bedrock of Christianity. And I am smoking a San Cristobal Revelation, five and a quarter by 54. So let's go ahead on over to the website and uh, check out what they have. San Cristobal Revelation A milk chocolate-hued Ecuador Sumatra wrapper is perfectly matured and drawn over a vintage core of Nicaraguan binder and filler tobaccos in San Cristobal Revelation. Six popular sizes intrigue with a versatile and luscious profile of cocoa, cinnamon, cedar, smoked almond, and black pepper. The succulent blend demonstrates subtlety and strength can exist side by side with an incredible mix of creamy and spicy flavors. And the strength is medium. Uh, country of Oregon origin is Nicaragua. And the wrapper is an Ecuador Sumatra. Their tasting notes are smoked almond, cedar, cinnamon, cocoa, and black pepper and a couple of awards they've won is top 25 cigars of the year from cigar aficionado in 2014 and they got a 92 rating from cigar aficionado in 2018 and the vitolas are the profit five and a quarter by 54 which is one i'm smoking uh, the mystic 5.625 by 48 the Odyssey, five and three quarters by 60. Legend, six and a quarter by 52. The Leviathan, six and a half by 64. And the Triumph, a seven by 50. That is the San Cristobal Revelation. All right, so let's get back into chapter five and finish it up of uh, Dr. Justin Bass's book, The Bedrock of Christianity. The title of this section is Pure Innovation. Let me wrap up this chapter by summarizing the unparalleled innovative claims of the Nazarenes. As we look at each of them, we have to ask, what made them respond to the death of their Messiah differently from anyone else before or since? Could it be, as Wright suggests, the reason they, in unparalleled fashion, claim their leader, Jesus, was alive again, was that he actually was? The first pure innovation we find from the early Christians is their positive interpretation of a crucified Messiah. We do not possess another example of a positive view of crucifixion and or the person crucified from the ancient world. As we heard from Cicero above, to put a Roman citizen to death is like murdering your own father. To crucify him? What? 
If there are no words to describe the crucifixion of a Roman citizen, how do we describe the crucifixion of God's Messiah? This is why Paul the Pharisee rejected Jesus, because his crucifixion proved he was under God's curse. This was no doubt the same thing Jesus' disciples thought on Good, Good Friday evening. Even if they still loved him and wept for him, Jesus' death meant he could not be God's Messiah. The testimony of one of Jesus' disciples on the Emmaus Road captures this thinking well. The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Luke 24, 19 through 21. We were hoping, but now all our hopes and dreams concerning this Jesus have been shattered due to his crucifixion. This mindset fits with everything we know about how ancient peoples viewed crucifixion, and Jews especially, in light of the dozen or so failed messianic movements. And yet Paul says within two decades of Jesus' crucifixion, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2 2. The cross became, for followers of Jesus, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. Again, this is extraordinary, and the historian is pressed for an explanation. The second unparalleled innovation was the claim that this crucified Messiah had risen from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 4b. Nowhere else do we find the claim of a two-stage resurrection in which the Messiah would rise from the dead and then everyone else at the still future resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. As we saw at the beginning of this chapter, any Jewish belief in a resurrection was always in the future. There was no expectation for a single person to be resurrected in the middle of history. But in Christianity, we find... As New Testament scholar Christopher Evans observes, a precise, confident, and articulate faith in which resurrection has moved from the circumference to the center. It is not enough to attempt to explain the Christian belief that Jesus had risen from the dead by claiming that many Jews believed in resurrection. As Raymond Brown writes, the contention that the Jewish mind had to express Jesus' victory over death by resurrection language, is simply inaccurate, for we know of several other models current in Judaism which might have been employed. On the contrary, since there was no expectation of an isolated resurrection within history, the choice of the category of resurrection must be explained. How did resurrection become the central belief of the early Christians? Moreover, where did they get this idea of a two-stage resurrection, and why did they claim this happened to the crucified man Jesus? Why did they not say Jesus was translated to heaven like Enoch, Genesis 5.24, or Elijah, 2 Kings 2.11-12, or Job's children, Testament of Job 39.1, through 40.6, or the two witnesses, Revelation 11.12. There were many categories of exalted saints, Ezra, 4th Ezra 14.48, and Baruch, 2nd Baruch 76.1-5, through 5, and martyred heroes of the past that could have been applied to Jesus, see Jubilees 23.31. The Maccabean martyrs were believed to have gained eternal life after death, but the general bodily resurrection was still future. 2 Maccabees 7.36 and 12.43-44 through 44. 
none of these figures until Jesus were ever claimed to be raised from the dead. Resurrection was consistently seen as a future event. It would happen to all the saints and martyrs, but in the renewed creation. It was the earliest Christians who, with pure innovation, brought these ideas of crucifixion, resurrection, and the Messiah together. As James Dunn summarizes, why draw the astonishing conclusion that the eschatological resurrection had already taken place in the case of a single individual quite separate from and prior to the general resurrection? There must have been something very compelling about the appearances for such an extravagant, not to say ridiculous and outrageous conclusion to be drawn. The third unparalleled innovation was that this crucified Messiah, whom God raised from the dead, was also divine and Lord of the world. This is the most shocking of them all, especially in the Jewish monotheistic context context from which this idea arose. No one expected the Messiah to be crucified and resurrected, but neither did anyone expect the Messiah to be in some sense God. Philippians 2.6 and Romans 9, 5. In the creedal tradition of 1 Corinthians 15, 3-7, we do not have such a claim of Jesus' divinity, only his death, burial, resurrection, and appearances. However, in Paul's early letters and other hymns, Paul, Paul quotes, Jesus is presented as pre-existing, Philippians 2, 6, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and 2 Corinthians 8, 9, involved in the creation of the universe, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, being worshipped, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, prayed to, Romans 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 16, 22, and 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9, sharing in Yahweh's unique identity and sovereignty, Philippians 2, 10 through 11, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and Romans 10, 13, and even called Lord, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Romans 10, 9, and Philippians 2, 11, and God, Romans 9, 5. Many scholars argue that Paul is quoting another early tradition, or hymn, that he received in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. For us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. Paul, and if not Paul, then the original composer of this hymn, is redefining the Shema, which he would have quoted at least daily as a devoted Pharisee. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4. These Jewish Nazarenes are still monotheists, but they began proclaiming that this crucified man Jesus shares in the unique identity with Yahweh, the one God of Israel. Dunn agrees this is unparalleled. Paul here splits the Shema between God the Father and Christ the Lord in a way that has no earlier parallel. The chart on the following page demonstrates the radical mutation within Paul's strict monotheism. New Testament scholar and leading expert on early Christian worship, Larry Hurtado, says, In early Christian circles, Jesus is recipient of the sorts of expressions of devotion that are otherwise reserved for God alone, and which simply have no analogy in Jewish tradition of the Second Temple period. Put simply, this worship of the risen, exalted Jesus comprises a radical new innovation in Jewish monotheistic religion. How does the historian account for this radical new innovation within first century Jewish monotheism? 
How is it possible that within two decades of Jesus' crucifixion, he was already being worshipped and presented as participating in the unique divine sovereignty of Yahweh, the God of Israel? As Hengel pointedly says, the Easter appearances alone do not suffice as an explanation for why the crucified one came to be recognized as the Messiah, Son of God, and Lord. And inserted here is one of those charts that, I, like I've said before, you won't have, so you need to pick up a copy of the book, which I highly recommend, so you can uh, check out this chart. The earliest confession of Jesus' divinity could not be due only to the belief in his resurrection. Even if his followers believed Jesus rose from the dead, why would monotheistic Jews worship and pray to him and say that Jesus participated in the creation of the world and shares in the identity and sovereignty of Yahweh himself? Along with their belief in the resurrection, the historical Jesus must have made claims concerning his divinity during his public ministry. To discuss the historical Jesus' claims to divinity, however, is beyond the scope of this book. In sum, a coming Messiah, resurrection, and monotheism were all concepts known in the ancient Jewish and Greco-Roman world, yet no one mutated them and put them together the way the early Christians did concerning Jesus. They uniquely, with unparalleled innovation, proclaimed that the crucified man Jesus was the Messiah, whom God raised from the dead and was also Lord of the world. These ideas arose within a monotheistic Jewish context and over a period of fewer than two decades after Jesus' crucifixion. This presses the historian for an explanation. Why did the early Christians begin to view Jesus' crucifixion in a positive manner? Why did they say Jesus rose from the dead as the first stage of a two-stage resurrection event? Or, as Dunn succinctly asks, So our question returns with added force. Why was the first articulation of post-Easter faith in in just these terms? Resurrection the beginning of the resurrection of the dead. Why did these monotheistic Jews, such as Paul, claim that Jesus was divine, pray to him, and worship him, even claiming he shared in the unique identity and sovereignty of Yahweh, the God of Israel? Who did this threefold innovation originate with? Peter? Mary Magdalene? James? Some unknown follower? If Jesus remained dead, the historian must must ask how it was that these innovations were created ex nihilo, or out of nothing. On the other hand, if Jesus burst through all the contemporary expectations of messiahship and resurrection and really did rise from the dead, then this was the unparalleled event in history that led to such unparalleled claims. Jesus' resurrection would then be the most unexpected and radically new innovation that the world had ever seen. In their innovative beliefs, then, the earliest followers of Jesus were attempting to explain an extraordinary and even haunting event. They could not fully grasp all of its implications, but what they could not deny was that Jesus being resurrection, resurrected meant the beginning of a new creation, a new chapter in cosmic history. The repeated phrase in the creedal tradition, he appeared, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, is the key to unlock the origins of these extraordinary innovations. And then I'll close out chapter 5 and uh, end this week's reading of Dr. Justin Bass's book, The Bedrock of Christianity. Uh, Please check out the show notes for links to Dr. Bass's website where you can check out his books and uh, his YouTube page. Also check out the link to this week's cigar and also Treats and Truth Ministry where you can get involved in helping to spread the gospel and be a blessing to the homeless. 
Also, groundworksministries.com for daily Bible studies and devotionals, and the Burning Bush Podcast merchandise store, where you can pick up some items to help spread the word about the show. And I'd appreciate it if you would tell your friends. So until next week, have a great day, have a great cigar, and God bless. Thank you.